My name is Ryan Pinchadsorum. I'm an advisor at Kleiner Perkins, as well as the co-author of Speed and Scale. Uh, Speed and Scale is not just a book by John and I, but it is a book actually that contains the wisdom of about a hundred different experts all around the world on this crisis. But it also includes 35 stories of heroes and leaders. These are policymakers like Christiana Figueres or entrepreneurs like the late Ryan Popple. And they really show us what's possible, truly what actions can be done. And I really encourage you to check it out at speedandscale.com. Well, the, what the book tries to do is it tries to address the question of what is the plan? And so back in the 40s, three months after Pearl Harbor, the same question was being asked about World War II. General Hap Arnold was meeting with FDR, and they spent the entire meeting on a singular topic, how do we win the war? And after this discussion, the president pulled out a cocktail napkin and sketched out these three big actions. The first was to hold four key territories. The second was to attack Japan. And the third was to defend Europe and beat the Nazis in the European region. It was clear, it was concise, it captured the complexity of a war on a single cocktail napkin. And so for us, the question once again is, what is the plan? The reality is we emit 59 gigatons each and every year. This is human-caused emissions. And the question we try to sometimes put, look at is, well, what is a gigaton, right? What does a gigaton actually feel like? We talk about this 59 number, but what does one actually, actually look like? When you look at uh, what it means in terms of coal plants, it is about 260 of them. There are about 6,000 coal plants around the world, and so that's why efforts like uh, Beyond Coal are so incredibly important. When you look at the number of cars on the road, there are about 215 million vehicles, so the electrification of them, that's why they're so critical. If you look at the number of trees, 7 million acres of trees is a gigaton when deforested. To put that in context, Yosemite is only about 2.5 million acres, and well, the Amazon is about 1.7 billion. So hence why protecting this land from being converted into places where people are raising cattle is so critical. Speaking of cattle, uh, about 115 million cows produce a gigaton of emissions. This is using the global warming potential of 20 years, not, not that 100 number. I share these four different statistics because that's what we're responsible for, right? Coming up with solutions that take these emissions out of the atmosphere. And when we look at where all these pieces adds up, most of us are familiar with these numbers, right? The 59 come from these industry, from energy, from industry, from agriculture, to transportation and deforestation from nature. This chart here is very, very familiar to all, right? It's the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. You know, if we tackled this crisis back in the 70s, right? When Exxon and team, their researchers started flagging these things as issues, we'd only have to cut our emissions at 10% each decade. If Al Gore hadn't conceded, or when he conceded 20 years ago uh, to President Bush, we'd only have to cut our emissions by 25% each decade. But now today, because of the place we are in and the time that we have left, we have to cut our emissions by a half before the end of this decade, and then the rest of the way there by 2050. This chart should look familiar to a lot of folks who have flipped through the IPCC report. This is the one that came out in the fall, and the first time it actually quantified how many emission, uh, uh, you know, what is our actual budget, what's left, what happens if we emit different categories. And so it really put out, we have 400 billion tons left if we want to keep warming to one and a half degrees. If we miss that target, it means things get a bit warmer. So if we miss it, it doesn't mean stop, right? We have to do everything we can to limit uh, it to the 400 and to get to zero as fast as possible. So this is the plan, right? We were super inspired by FDR, super inspired by that cocktail napkin. Could you put a world of effort onto a simple napkin? This napkin captures the 10 different objectives. Uh, and actually really quickly curious, how many folks are familiar with OKRs? 
object a wonderful. Okay, so for folks that don't know what OKRs are, they're objectives and key results. And so John Doerr is perhaps the, you know, John, he calls himself the Johnny Appleseed of OKRs. It's a goal setting tool used by companies like Google and others. But we applied that to the climate crisis and we have six objectives that capture the solutions. Uh, let me zoom in on those right here. There you go. Uh, right here, which is everything from electrifying transportation to decarbonizing the grid, fixing food, which specifically means eat less beef, waste less food uh, as well, protecting nature, ending deforestation, cleaning up industry, and then removing carbon. This last objective here, we actually didn't want to include in the book. Right? We really wanted to find ways that we could reduce our emissions and get to zero without this last category. But no matter how you slice it, no matter how aggressive actions you take, everyone from the IPCC to our modelers show that we're still left with 10 gigatons a year. And so we're gonna have to find ways to do both nature-based and engineered removal that takes five gigatons each out. But as you can see, this countdown goes from 59 to zero if we do these actions. The second part of the plan are the accelerants. So that's how we get to zero, but the question is how do we get there faster? And so these accelerants here are ways that we can use other levers. We have folks that are working on the solutions in this room, but a lot of other of us are working on these other things, right? What policies need to be passed? What movements can actually result in action? Everything from the ballot box all the way to what happens in corporate boardrooms. We need to innovate like crazy, and we also need to invest. It's going to cost $4 trillion a year to get us where we need to go. Thankfully, most of that money is things that we already spend on, right? The cars that we would buy, the energy that we would purchase. There's only like an additional trillion that does need to be spent. It's really about redirecting the existing. And so with that plan, I wanna kind of dig into two sets of KRs because we're all kind of nerdy here and I think you'd quite like these. We put ourselves to the test and said, to electrify transportation, what does that really mean? The first KR is around price. If EVs do not hit price parity with their fossil fuel counterparts, we can't expect this transition to happen. If you jump a little farther down, we wanna make sure by 2024, Five, that all trucks and new buses that are, sorry, by 2025, all buses that are purchased should be EVs. If you do the ROI today, it makes sense today to make that switch. So by 2025, if we notice that we're still selling diesel buses, we're not on track. You look at the KR 1.4, which shows where the five gigatons are, that's the ultimate measure. How many miles driven on the road are coming from cars? And uh, sorry, fossil fuel vehicles. You look at one accelerant, right? This is an example of an OKR around the accelerants that matter. We need to make voting a top two issue in every country around the world, but really specifically the top five emitters. We also need to make sure businesses are committing to net zero, not only for their operations, but all scope one, two, three. You can also see that we have KRs around equity, ensuring that health, education, as well as job creation happens. These accelerants, if we hit them, we know that the solutions will progress faster. And so another way to think about this and to kind of frame the, the way this challenge is that these 59 billion tons of emissions are someone else's business model, right? People don't just emit for emitting sake, right? They're doing it for survival, but they're also doing it for the joys of life, eating, traveling, moving, and so forth. And so we need to find alternatives. And without alternatives, people are going to pick the status quo. And so if we expect these emission reductions to happen, we've got two different ways as innovators to, to do it. The first is to, uh, well, we first have to beat the business models, but the first is to do it by achieving stellar performance, right? People have to want to pick the cleaner and greener thing. I think when you look at surveys, only 10% of the actions are done because it's the right thing to do, but for the other 90, it's because it's the thing that they want to do. Right? And so when we think of stellar performance, think of EVs, think of Tesla, think of every garage is actually a place, you know, a gas station. People choose it because it's a faster, funner, and more convenient vehicle. When you look at solar deployments and storage deployments in California and Texas, folks are picking it because it's the more resilient option, right? They're picking it because it performs better. You know, the things we build have to actually perform better. Uh, look at this plant-based protein, right? When you think about the switch of away from eating beef, people need tastier alternatives. In the book, we really say pick a lower emitting protein. So pick chicken, pick fish, but also pick this incredible cadre of 
really tasty plant-based alternatives, which truly emit the least. You know, if the trends go the way that plant-based milks went, we can assume this is gonna follow those trends. I think it was like 2% a decade ago, and plant-based milks are, are at like 20% of the market now. So there's excitement there. The second way uh, we achieve this as innovators is we've got to get to a green discount. I think um, Bill Gates does an incredible job of explaining the um, uh, green premium, right? This is the difference between the clean green thing versus the fossil fuel equivalent. And unfortunately, across every single part of the way we live our lives, the green premium exists. And so it's up to us as not just to innovators, but policymakers and investors to find ways to drive down that cost. And when you take a green premium and get it to zero, and it becomes a green discount when things become cheaper, market forces will take over. And you can see that actually quite well in one area, wind and solar. Five years ago when COP happened, wind and solar was more expensive than the fossil fuel equivalent. At this COP at Glasgow, the tables have turned. You take wind, solar, and storage, it's still a bit more expensive than gas. But one thing we can be confident about clean green technologies is that the cost curve is going down and they're predictable. So getting to that green discount is incredibly important. As innovators, these five KRs are our North Stars. You'll notice that we focus on cost, right? Not the next shiny big thing because that's what excites you, but those things actually have to prove they can compete. They have to prove that you can get to a battery cost of 80, 80 bucks a kilowatt hour, that we can produce them at the scale needed to switch all these vehicles as well as getting you know, good storage in homes and such. Electricity, when you think between what's going to win, geothermal or fusion or you know, lithium, you know, uh, solar or wind, cost matters at the end of the day. Green hydrogen, same thing too. When you think about carbon removal, that five gigatons engineered and five gigatons nature that we need, we've got to get that cost down to 100 by the end of this decade and then 50 bucks by uh, the uh, 2040 timeframe. You do that, it becomes affordable to do. Carbon neutral fuels, right? We can say fly less, but people still are flying. And so we actually need to invest in and create carbon neutral fuels that let us enjoy flight while not emitting. And so that path there is actually a really hard and long one. So for innovators, those are the KRs that matter. Um, and it's our charge, right? I think in this room here, we have actually maybe curious, how many folks here are founders and entrepreneurs? Amazing. How many are investors? Uh, any policymakers? I'm a former federal employee. Amazing. Um, and then also activists as well, too, who've been fighting the fight. Amazing. This piece here, it's going to take all of us, right? We all are innovators, and we all have to find and use the muscle that we have to get this transition to happen faster. Um, the thing that we have to, you know, Dr. Hayhoe said, if you take your personal carbon footprint, it's only 20% of the puzzle. That's so true, right? The gigatons, they actually come from where these sources of energy come from, right? The decisions that companies make, the decisions that cities make. And so when you think about the actions that you can take in your life, those are expected. But we need everybody to step up and go after the collective actions, specifically the ones that can get us to halfway there by 2030. And with that, um, David and I are going to have a very small conversation because I think the time is ticking. But I just want to kind of leave with a reminder that we both need the now, right? We have the technologies that we need that can get us there halfway. But we also need a lot of the new because concrete's hard. Steel is hard. Carbon neutral stuff doesn't exist. And so that's where the innovators come in. Thank you. You know, Kleiner Perkins, at least in my generation, is kind of seen as the epicenter of Silicon Valley in some ways. You know, you could have Google's headquarters, but that was kind of created by Kleiner Perkins, right, et cetera, and so on. The tech industry mm -hmm. as a body, you know, you're talking about a lot of things that require more collaboration, working together. How would you assess the state of the tech industry's approach to climate and the degree to which it's working together as an industry? Oh, good, great question. Uh, as a tech industry, most of the tech industry, because they deal in bits and not like the analog world, right? It's actually quite easy for them to set incredibly ambitious net zero goals, right? And so if you're a tech company that just has, just has data centers, you can really set some aggressive targets. But there, are a, there is a world of the tech industry which are actually hardware items, right? And you're actually seeing incredible innovation from companies like Apple and others that are sourcing better, right? It takes the leading edge 
to go after and find these alternatives to invest in ahead of others. And so that's the inspiring part from the you know, tech industry status quo and seeing them, one, make these ambitious commitments. Google and their green procurements that they do, like they're really paving the okay, way. Okay, but yeah. that's not what I meant. But ah, that is good. Yeah. What you said was good. But I mean to develop the solutions. Ah, so to develop the solutions, I mean, you're seeing more energy come from, I would say, across the country. David, right? No, you're we actually, want everybody to do it, but are those people doing it enough? Uh, are the, uh, you know maybe use measure one of the KRs around venture capital? Just two years ago, right year end, I think we were at thirteen billion dollars deployed. We set a KR, a really ambitious one, saying we need to get fifty billion dollars a year deployed into tech companies to create these solutions. And John and I thought it would happen by the end of the decade. It happened last year. Mm. And I think it's happening okay, because you have these incredible public market comps of Tesla, Sunrun, Enphase, and others. And so now folks are seeing it isn't as risky of a, as a bet, an investment that you know, Kleiner and others did in Cleantech 1.0. Right. If there's actually pathways, like John Doerr always calls this like an incredibly underhyped opportunity. He said the internet was underhyped in the 90s, but now clean energy and those technologies, it's incredibly underhyped as well. Okay, yeah. that's good. And we're going to talk about that formally a little later. So thank you so much. Of course. Thank you for having me. Thank really you. Really good. Yeah.